Hello and welcome to our webinar on importance. My name is Stefan Konradi and I will be your host today. Thank you so much for joining our program today, whether you've logged into the Zoom webinar or whether you're watching us on Facebook where we're streaming this webinar for the first time live today. Let me start off with today's agenda and we have a lot to talk about. So uh, we'll start off talking about our motivation and our objective, which is how can we quantify importance and interpret all related measures. But before we can do that, we really need to talk about dimensions of reasoning. And for, for those of you who have watched previous webinars or attended seminars, this is something we've talked about a lot. We've tried to give dimensions to our whole approach of reasoning. And in this context, we'll have to distinguish between prediction and causation, theory versus data, probabilistic versus deterministic models. And uh, we will propose Bayesian networks as our principal reasoning framework. Now, um, as we continue, we then want to proceed into predictive modeling and talk specifically about the types of measures that we can use for importance, um, such as total effects. We will take a little excursion into the world of information theory. We'll need to talk about entropy and mutual information, which really provide us with the basis for other measures like arc force and node force. Then we will talk about the Bayes factor as a very important measure of importance of information. And we'll also briefly introduce a tornado chart that Bayesia Lab offers to visualize the, the importance of variables. So, so far that was all about predictive modeling, then we'll move into the importance of causal or the concept of importance in causal modeling. There we'll talk about direct effects, contribution, uh, contributions and elasticity. Now, please note that not all of these measures belong exclusively into predictive modeling or causal modeling. I'm merely presenting them in, in these contexts. Uh, some, some are truly exclusive to either side, total effects in predictive modeling, uh, direct effects in causal modeling, but others may have applications on both sides. And I'll very much emphasize this distinction, predictive modeling versus causal modeling throughout today. So uh, one thing I should mention up front is that all the materials you see today, the slides, the videos, the, the models, the network models, they will all be a, available on this page where you can download all these materials from. So, so much uh, up front. Let me get straight to our motivation. And uh, we all use importance and important very liberally and, and casually. And a Google search reveals that there are over 5 million papers that include the importance of in their title. I speculate that most of these papers do refer to indeed a similar concept, but I doubt that they all mean precisely the same thing. So um, perhaps some of the synonyms around importance give us a sense of the vast spectrum of related concepts. And linguists probably will very much appreciate a discussion about all the nuances. But if we look at the corporate world, if you ask executives and decision makers, they're probably not so keen to quibble over the finer points of importance. <clears throat> However, <clears throat> excuse me, as we will see, there is indeed a lot to it, and it's not just an academic question. Differentiating all the types of importance is really important. Now, unfortunately, understanding the importance of things in the world is much more involved than just reading the gauges of a big machine where we can immediately see what's flowing through what pipe. Um, when we talk about, the, about importance in the world, when we talk about the importance of things, most often we need to do this on an abstract basis. 
using either an informal mental model or a formal mathematical model that represents the dynamics of the domain we're interested in. So, but commonly, those domains under study are not completely known. Otherwise, there would probably be no debate about the importance of the elements in such a domain. There's presumably very little discussion about the role and importance of the brake pedal in an automobile. So when we debate importance, our reasoning typically must be based on some sort of approximation and some model of the underlying reality. And before we start building and using models to, and to reason with them, we need to add or we'd like to add structure or dimensions to our reasoning. And for those who have attended previous seminars, as I said earlier, this will be very familiar ground. Let's start with the first step or the first dimension, which is about model purpose. What do we build models for? And it is very important that we make the distinction between predictive models and causal models. So that will be our first axis that makes up our coordinate system for our dimensions of reasoning. The second axis that we propose is where models come from, how we generate them. Now, um, at the bottom end of this axis, we have theory because we can build models from our domain knowledge and encode them as, as formulas, as networks, and so on. Or we could alternatively also machine learn such models from data. So we can just through all kinds of fancy learning algorithms uh, just dis discover discover what's in data and build models that way. And finally, there is a, a third dimension, the third axis that I want to propose, and that is the one that distinguishes between probabilistic and deterministic models. For instance, if our problem domain includes probabilities, a logical model will not be able to adequately capture the dynamics. Now that we have these dimensions, we need a modeling framework that can cover this spectrum, this entire range. Ideally, we want a single framework that can handle all these dimensions. And as it turns out, um, you will not be surprised that we propose to use Bayesian networks because that's what our business is all about. Having said that, Bayesian networks can indeed cover this entire spectrum. Bayesian networks are very convenient as a modeling framework because we can build them from theory, we can machine learn them from data, we can use them for prediction, we can perform causal inference with them, and we can also deal with probabilistic problems as, and as well as deterministic domains. So really, they're, they're quite universal. In many of our webinars, we have captured the complete workflow, or in each case study, we've gone through all the steps from building the model to analyzing and optimizing with the model. Now, today, we were kind of constraining ourselves. We just focus on taking existing models and interpret them with regard to the importance of their nodes and the relationships in those, in those networks. And of course, Bayesian Lab, Bayesian Lab 8 that is, is the product that you will see in action today. That's our software that utilizes the Bayesian network framework. And perhaps you already know Bayesian Lab is part of an ecosystem of software packages we have desktop packages, web applications, and APIs. But today, for our purpose today, we'll just look at Bayesian Lab 8 Professional. So let's look at our dimensions again. And as I mentioned earlier, we need to make a very clear distinction between prediction and causation. So please allow me to exaggerate a bit to make my point. I'm putting this huge brick wall between prediction and causation. We always need to know which side we're on. And we never want to inadvertently go across this barrier. 
Um, and a good way to think about these two sides is as follows. On the left side, we perform inference in the, ter in the sense of given that I see. I predict given that I see, as opposed to on the right side, I infer given that I do, I want to see the consequence of an action that I perform. Let me give you a little silly example that illustrates this point to make really sure we're all on the same, on the same side, uh, so to say. Um, given that I see many people with umbrellas from my office window, I infer that it is probably raining. I can't see the rain itself, just the umbrellas. Still, I would say I can fairly reliably infer or predict that it is currently raining. Perhaps it's summer and the marginal probability of rain is low. It rarely rains in the summer, but given that I see that umbrellas are down, or people with umbrellas are out and about, I, my conditional probability of rain, that rain is true, would be high. So that I think is very, very reasonable and I would think all of you will agree with me on that. Now, if we change the setting, um, let's now switch from seeing to doing and considering that the marginal probability of rain is still low, so it's perhaps it's still summer, so it rarely rains. Now, what happens if I open up an umbrella? Well, absolutely nothing. So what this means is using a predictive model here is entirely inappropriate. The correct causal model would say that opening an umbrella does not change the probability of rain. So, um, and using a predictive model here would be entirely wrong. Using a predictive model for answering a causal question most often is totally inappropriate, yeah? So just to illustrate again, given that I see versus given that I do. But for now, let's focus on given that I see. We will talk about importance in predictive modeling. So um, the specific measures that we will talk about are total effects, entropy, mutual information, and so on. And as I also mentioned earlier, we're, we're not discussing how to build or learn Bayesian networks. We, we simply want to use them and, and, and basically analyze them so we can understand the importance of variables. And it, even though we don't derive the models you see, I make references to the seminars and webinars in which we introduced these particular examples. And I will also share the networks and everything on the page I referenced earlier. So you can really see how we arrived at the given models, uh, they are not just coming out of the blue, out of nowhere, so, so you can go back and look that up. So let's perhaps start with the simplest measure of importance, and that is the total effect. Um, that's how we refer to it in Bayesian Lab. It basically says, given that I observe a change of one unit in variable x, how much change would I observe in a variable Y? That is actually very similar to what you would see um, in, in, as parameter estimates or coefficients in a regression, where you might typically use betas to represent what a unit change of X does to Y. Let me now put this in the context of an example. This is a, an example about diagnosing coronary artery disease uh, on which we conducted a, a webinar some time ago. And uh, yes, so as I said, we're not deriving the whole model, we're not learning it, rather we're just presenting it here. And uh, yes, so, Here's a slide, that's all I wanted to show. So um, in, in this model now, uh, condition is our target node. That condition has two states, uh, normal and coronary artery disease. And out of the many predictors that we have, 
uh, and and there are lots of predictors in this in this data set in this diagnostic data set everything and lots of measures blood values um, diagnostic measures uh, chest chest pain pulse rate blood pressure and so on body mass index all these are we have as we learned them all we've, we've identified those as predictors and now we want to really see how can we establish their precise importance with regard to the target node condition and one measure i want to look at in particular and this is the erythrocyte sedimentation rate that is measured in millimeter millime, millimeters per hour so and just to be clear on nomenclature i'm now going to use these two variables a lot and since uh, one of them has a very long name erythrocyte sedimentation rate Later on, I'll abbreviate it as ESR or just E. So, um, and yeah, because when I started using this example, I didn't realize that the name was so long. And then later on, as I built the slides, I realized, you know, there's just not no space for such a long variable name. But what is that? What is erythrocyte sedimentation rate? Um, that's a type of blood test that measures how these uh, erythrocytes, red blood cells, settle at the bottom of the test tube. That's an indicator of whether your body um, has inflammation, and that in turn could be a predictor of coronary artery disease. Now we want to figure out precisely how does that, how does that, um, how does that work? So, um, so we're now just focusing on these two variables, condition and erythro erythrocyte sedimentation. So, and to analyze and achieve that in Bayesian labs through we'll report target total effects on target, which brings up the total effects report that gives us a whole bunch of measures, uh, standardized total effect, total effect, um, et cetera. And here what we really, need to understand is total effect that refers to the unit effect. And here it comes out as 0 0.0084, which really refers to uh, a point, uh, point 0.8% increase in the probability of coronary artery disease, given that the erythrocyte sedimentation rate goes up by one unit. So we can simply simulate this in the given model. Um, we, we can set the erythro erythrocyte sedimentation rate to higher. We can simulate plus one and then observe what the outcome is. And here indeed we can see that we expect to see an increase by plus 8%. So that was uh, running this the running the direct, the, sorry, the total effects analysis. However, there is also a different way of looking at it, and that is doing a visual analysis. And here, instead of just looking at, looking for a single value, here we're computing, we're simulating entire range of values for the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and this would look like this. So here, Bayesian lab plots us on the x-axis, the range of values for the erythrocyte sedimentation rate. On the y-axis, we have the probability of uh, having coronary artery disease. And now to link up both the, what I reported earlier, the, the, the total effect, and here this total effects curve, let me show you how Bayesian lab calculates this curve, or not, not uh, the curve, but rather how Bayesian lab calculates this unit effect, the, the total effect. So, the way it is computed is Bayesian lab looks at the mean value of erythrocyte sedimentation, value, uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, 
um, which here would be around 19.5. At that mean value, Bayesian Lab takes the derivative around that narrow area. That's the unit effect. That's the total effect. So um, that is very straightforward. But now, uh, if, we, if we look at this a little bit more closely, here we have the situation that in that area around the mean, this curve appears to be fairly linear, but it is certainly not linear across the entire range. So a slope, this little, the total effect really is only characteristic for this narrow area, but not for the entire curve. So as we look at the, at the total effects report, and now here on the left we have the table for all the variables in the network in this predictive model, not just for a risk for site sedimentation rate. And we can, Bayesian Lab computes all these values, which are all the derivative around the mean. For some, it's it's appropriate for some others it isn't because as we can see on the right hand side of the, the of the right panel on the right plot not all of them are close to being linear and so that's something we always need to bear in mind as we evaluate total effects are they is the underlying curve linear in which case we can we can use that or is it even a continuous variable because let's say we had weekday or a color red, green, and blue, then uh, if there was no order to that to those states, we couldn't really use them. We couldn't inter inter interpret them either for the total effects report, nor for the target mean analysis, the plot that we see on the right hand side. So. Uh, moving on, there's another way that is very helpful to understand the relevance of the individual variables that we have here. And now we are including again all the variables, all the nodes in the model. And this is what we call the tornado charts or tornado diagrams. Um, what they tell us, what they give us a sense of is how values of our predictors can affect the, the probability of the condition. In this case, we're primarily interested in the presence or absence of coronary artery disease. And I think the tornado chart on the right shows that very nicely. There are certain variables that can really move the needle a lot, um, and they are kind of stacked towards the top, and others have much less influence. It kind of gives us a sense of you know, how far they can move the needle in terms of if I observe this, how much change would I expect? And what is very interesting here, they are not necessarily symmetric. So for instance, if I look at Q wave, depending on what I observe, um, that value can only basically be bad news. Well, there's, there is no upside to this, to observing this particular value. So, um, just another way, and you can see that there are, there are so many facets to importance that we could now actually look at many other visualizations that help us understand, understand this better. Um, but you may now ask, well, why do we call it total effects as opposed to just effects? Well, what is important to bear in mind that in the Bayesian network, inference is always performed in all directions regardless of the arc direction. So let me illustrate this here uh, by plotting the influence path of erythrocyte sedimentation rate to condition. Bayesian Lab allows us to analyze the model regarding all the information paths that exist between between the nodes. And here we're interested in, in erythrocyte sedimentation rate and condition. Once I start that function, I get a table that now allows me to select all of the paths that exist. Here, the simplest one is the, the direct path between erythrocyte sedimentation and condition. Um, I'm highlighting this here. Then there's a second one that goes from erythrocyte sedimentation 
via hypertension, that is blood pressure or high blood pressure to condition. And there is a third one that goes from erythrocyte sedimentation to hypertension to age to condition. So as Bayesian Lab computes the total effects, all these paths of how information can flow are taken into account. So, very important point. Uh, let me just illustrate what that means, or uh, here in this particular case, I've now also added age as a, um, in, the, um, in the panel on the right, because as you may know, on the right-hand side, we have the monitor panel in Bayesian Lab, where we can bring up the monitors that represent the nodes that we have in the network on the left-hand side. Um, so let's say I'm, I'm setting an arbitrary value for erythrocyte sedimentation. And given that observation, Bayesian Lab updates the belief in coronary artery disease, but from our network, from our model, we also see that age changes. So we have now a new distribution for age, which is in the, um, uh, the zoomed in monitor, or the, the enlarged monitor, we see that the age, the mean age increases. We see the little arrows that indicate how the individual age groups change. And that in turn affects hypertension and hypertension again is associated with an increased probability of having coronary artery disease. So, um, so what have we done so far? We've inferred the expected change in the mean value of a target variable, given that we observe a change in a predictor variable. So uh, we just talked about really the, the absolute values. Now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about what we can learn about the uncertainty of one variable given another variable. So here we'll take a quick detour into the world of information theory and refer to uh, some of the concepts that were introduced by Claude Shannon and really consider here information as the resolution of uncertainty. Now there's a very formal way of how we can measure uncertainty and this is here in this famous formula for entropy minus p log p and you don't need to know this at all but it's, it's kind of good to, to be aware of how or that it can be very easily and formally calculated for any distribution for, for any variable. And so that's what we do here for, for condition, for instance, with two states, normal and disease, uh, we can plug in this distribution into the formula and can get a value for the marginal entropy. So now the question is, is this good or bad or a lot or a little? By itself, we can't really interpret that. Rather, what we need to do is compare it to the maximal possible entropy which would be a 50-50 distribution. There we would have perfect uncertainty. It's like flipping a coin. With the 50-50 distribution, we have an entropy of one. That would be the maximum possible entropy. Conversely, the minimum possible entropy would be the complete absence of uncertainty. This is if we knew the state, if we know a patient has that disease, then the entropy is zero. There is no longer any uncertainty left. So this, these kind of boundaries give us a sense of where we stand with the current distribution of condition. So, but we're not done yet. Please bear with me as I'm taking you through this. Now we're no longer looking at the marginal entropy, but at the conditional entropy. We now put condition in relation to one of its predictors. And here again, we use erythrocyte sedimentation. What we're going to do now is set observations on each possible state of erythrocyte sedimentation, and then calculate the corresponding entropy of condition. We do that for all three possible state, states of erythrocyte sedimentation. 
uh, we get three entropies and then we can take the weighted average that gives us the conditional entropy of erythrocyte sedimentation. Now I really realize how the, how the, the name of the variables is a, a bit challenging because I'm talking about conditional entropy of a variable named condition and erythrocyte sedimentation is really a long term uh, a long word that is difficult to pronounce. So in my next webinar, I'll probably pick something that is slightly easier to say. Anyway, um, where do I go with this, uh, with this conditional entropy? What we can do now that we have the marginal entropy and the conditional entropy, and we have computed the numerical values of both, that is the definition of mutual information. That tells us how much information condition and erythrocyte sedimentation rate have in common. So that is very, very powerful. Also, uh, this is a symmetric metric. Um, it basically, it's, from, it's between them what these two variables have in common. Very, very powerful measure, and we will see that in, we, you see that in many examples that we share. And uh, here I now want to expand that and not just show it for erythrocyte sedimentation, but actually for all the predictors that we have in this particular model. So there's a list, and what we can do here is immediately use mutual information and some of their derived measures such as normalized mutual information, relative mutual information, and use them as a kind of ranking or use them for ranking to give us a sense of what variables are more or less important with regard to the target node uh, condition. Here we see that at the very top, it's typical chest pain that has the greatest amount of mutual information with the target node. It seems, or what that means is typical chest pain is highly informative on whether or not you have coronary artery disease or not. Erythrocyte sedimentation is more towards the middle, so it's also informative, but not nearly as much as typical chest pain. Now, in Bayesian lab, you can showcase mutual information in, in many different contexts. Uh, we just saw the report, and here we go. The, the, the slide build was a little bit out of sequence here. A very nice way of showing mutual information is what we call the mapping function, or inside the mapping function, where we can size all the nodes according to their mutual information with the target node. So here we can see uh, typical chest pain is indeed the biggest one. And then we could just get a quick sense, a quick feel as kind of a sanity check of the role and the importance of these nodes. This is a very good way when we share models with stakeholders and kind of compare that to their expertise and say, hey, this doesn't make sense. From your clinical experience, is that you know, is that indeed the most important variable for you? Now, now um, yet another way to show mutual information is directly on the graph, on, on the network. And because it can get very busy with so many pieces of information, uh, I have now built a smaller network, or a simpler network. And uh, because this gives me the opportunity to directly display mutual information on the arcs. So now you see these panels with lots of numbers and I'll soon zoom in into one. And there you will go through the um, mutual information and all its derivatives. So let me actually do that and zoom out. Uh, so on the left we have condition, on the right I'm using again erythrocyte sedimentation rate. And now these are all measures that relate to mutual information. The top one is the one we computed earlier, um, the sort of the, the base value, but that really 
or the it's not very informative by itself because it very much depends on how many states the nodes have as to what the possible range is for uh, for for the value of mutual information. Therefore, we have normalized mutual information available that takes into account, in this case, uh, the, the number of states for erythrocyte sedimentation. So blue always is going in the direction of the arc. The red number always refers to the opposite direction, against the grain. So that's, that's how we know what these blue and red numbers mean. So, so the first blue one is normalized mutual information with regard to erythrocyte sedimentation or normalized based on the maximal entropy of erythrocyte sedimentation. And in the other way, it is normalized by the maximum entropy given the number states of the node condition. Then we keep going. Um, there is a symmetric normalized mutual information, which is between them and it takes into account the number of states of both uh, condition and erythrocyte sedimentation. The next one is relative mutual information. Um, and that's, that's quite helpful. This is actually one of my favorite measures because it tells me by which amount variable C reduces percentage-wise the uncertainty of E. Uh, perhaps it's, it's more important to look at it the other way around, where we go from E to C. That tells us this 5.69% tells us knowing the value for erythrocyte sedimentation reduces the uncertainty, the entropy of condition by roughly 5.7%. And that's a really, really very tangible and useful and easy to interpret measure. And it really gives us a sense of how many, how much predictive information is contained in such a variable. And finally, we also have the symmetric normalized mutual information, which just takes both entropies into account. Now, it may, be, may sound complicated, but ultimately it's a very intuitive concept. And um, what is so attractive about this measure of mutual information is that it always works regardless of this, the scale of the variable, of whether it's categorical, numerical, so I can, you know, if I had a variable that represents color and another one that represents temperature, I could quantify how much the color tells me about the temperature and vice versa. So a very, very universal measure that we use a lot and you should use a lot too. So um, now so far we've talked about the average amount of information shared between two variables, but um, the, the case specific relevance may very much depends may very much depend on the state of the actual observation. And here we're introducing the concept of Bayes factor that can quantify how observations are consistent with a hypothesis with a hypothesis or other pieces of evidence that we have observed so far. So let's run this now again on, on the bigger network. Um, it's actually the same report that we ran earlier, but now we're scrolling down in this report and highlighting the column that says Bayes factor. And the way we can interpret this now is how the modal value, the, the most often observed value in this data set either supports the, uh, in this case, the condition coronary artery disease. So we have actually two tables stacked on top of each other, both in each represents one state of condition. This says that the state coronary artery disease is supported by typical chest pain. So, so that, um, if that, if coronary artery disease 
is my hypothesis, typical chest pain would support that, as opposed to the observation, let's scroll down a little bit further, perhaps just to the, to the next line. If, the, in, and here in this case, the modal value is zero, the absence of regional wall motion abnormality, that would actually be contradicting evidence with regard to coronary artery disease. So, so this gives us a sense of how observations support or disagree with existing evidence or given hypothesis. Here, here's an example of how that, and that's perhaps a little bit more intuitive. So here we have a gentleman at age 70, he's at the doctor and the doctor says, you have high blood pressure. And probably at age 70, most people have elevated blood pressure. So the age and the blood pressure, there are consistent, so we would have a base factor if we were to calculate it here with our model, for instance, uh, that would be a base factor greater than one. However, if we had an, a patient who is age 19 and the doctor tells him that he has high blood pressure, that would be inconsistent given the model, given that what we know. So the Bayes factor would say here, hey, that these two pieces of evidence, they are conflicting pieces of evidence. This is very important, for instance, in the clinical process. Also, uh, you can imagine at criminal trials where you have quite often pieces of evidence that don't agree. And you have prosecutors and defense attorneys presenting opposite sides, presenting their evidence. And the Bayes factor on the basis of model can then calculate, well, wh what is the amount of agreement or disagreement? But uh, that's perhaps a, a topic for another webinar. Now, just a quick outlook. Um, there is a lot more in this particular report that will be revealed as part of the Bayesia Lab 9 launch on October 10th at our seventh annual Bayesia Lab conference. So just bear this in mind, there are constantly new things under development in Bayesia Lab. And here with, with target analysis report, I almost accidentally spilled the beans and had my colleagues not caught it. I would have given you a preview here of features that are not supposed to be released yet. So uh, wait until October 10th and you'll see some really cool new stuff. Now, um, so far, everything that we talked about in terms of importance was, was with respect to a single variable, like a target variable. But when we talk about predictive models, they are not limited to predicting just a single target variable. For instance, using Bayesian Labs unsupervised learning, we can learn models that simultaneously predict all variables in the domain. Um, the, the learning process itself is out of scope for today. However, we want to understand how to evaluate the importance of variables and relationships in such a network. So uh, let me give you an example that probably makes a little bit more sense. And here I see uh, there is a font missing, which screwed up the, um, the bottom panel here. In the video, I will fix this so you can see the, the, related, the related webinar that tells us about the background of this particular example. So the, the domain is exchange traded funds, basically a type of investment that we have observed over a number of years. Rather, we observed a specific uh, specific groups of investments, agriculture, industrials, telecommunication, utilities, energy, and so on. So investments grouped by, um, by category, by investment theme, if you will. And we wanted to see how all they relate to each other. And here's a network that we came up with, which we presu uh, produced with unsupervised learning. And here is no target node. We're not really focusing on anything particular. We, now we perhaps want to know in this domain what relationships are important. You know, are some more important 
than others, and yeah, we don't have a target. So one great measure to apply here is what we or what is known as kulbach leibler divergence, which we often simply refer to as arc force. What it does, and now I've turned that on, um, the kulbach leibler divergence is the quantity, basically the amount of information that this network would lose if we were to remove that arc. It basically compares the joint probability of the given network and then a an hypothetical alternative network in which the arc that we're interested in is removed. So in, so in this case, Bayesian Lab computed all the alternatives and then looked at, well, how important or how much information was lost. And with that, can assign a specific value. So here, for instance, between the nodes gold and broad agriculture, uh, there is the arc force of 0.0427. And again, to bring that into context, we co compute here how much that information, how much that arc force is relative to the sum of all the arc forces in the network. That's just a good way to, to get a sense of among all the arcs that we have that we have learned, well, how, how important is that one? It's also a good way Bayesian Lab allows us to filter uh, by setting an arc force threshold. So we can just say, show us the, the, the most important arc, which in this case here is the arc between gold and alpha seeking. That has the highest arc force and is therefore the strongest, or if you will, the most important arc in the network. Now, this particular measure, arc force, we can also um, show in the context of mapping. Here we have the thickness of the arcs that is proportional to, um, yeah, to the kulbach leibler divergence to the arc force. And there is a derived, and that is the node force, that is the sum of the arc forces at each node. And so here the node size is proportional to the node force. That gives us a sense of you know, how important is each node in the network relative to all the other nodes. Again, a very convenient concept. Um, we can also go and visualize this in, in, in three dimensions. Uh, this is helpful when you go into, um, into larger networks where you just can't capture any longer um, all the nodes and all the arcs in two dimensions. So we can go into three dimensions. We can even go into virtual reality and visualize these measures. Um, but here that, that gives us a sense in one view, we see what's, what are the most important nodes? What are the most important arcs in a domain? Very, very suitable for unsupervised learning to interpret a model that is learned with unsupervised learning. Okay, so uh, this concludes our discussion of predictive modeling. Now we go to the dark side, if you will, uh, given that we do. Uh, so it's no longer what we would expect to see given an observation, and now it is about what change we would bring about given an intervention. Now, whenever we talk about causal inference, the easiest way to deal with that is to try it out, to run experiments. And that is really remains the gold standard for yeah, establishing causal effects. So, you know, if we had a, a, a testing equipment and wanted to figure out the, you know, what elements of a spring, how important they are, um, we could just try out different configurations, leave everything else the same, and thus determine here, in this case, the formula for spring stiffness. Uh, in a different context, in marketing science, we could, may want to try to do A-B testing where we present randomly different versions of a web page to check the 
conversion or response rate, that would be an experiment too. But um, in many cases, experiments are just not possible, be it for ethical reasons or cost or practicality or, you know, we don't have the time or what have you. So, so it, for most, in most contexts, when we need to answer causal questions, we actually don't have the ability to run experiments. So that's um, our challenge. And, and so what we now need to do is to calculate causal effects without experiments. So what we need to do is we need to have models that are based on theoretical causal knowledge that comes from experts plus observational data. Uh, and this can be a very challenging process uh, and it may not even be always possible. A single wrong assumption, in fact, can render the estimation of a causal effect totally useless. Uh, and the, the details of causal identification, estimation, we've discussed in many other seminars and book chapters. And so you will find numerous videos on, on that topic in our seminar and webinar archive. So what we want to do now is look at a domain where we have a, um, a product portfolio. This is an example from the auto industry. And it's about the fact that when car makers introduce new models into a product portfolio, they not just compete with the competitor, but presumably they also compete internally with, an, with the existing model lineup. Uh, there's presumably some sort of substitution or cannibalization effect. So perhaps the buyer who ends up buying model D would have purchased model C had D not been available. So our theory, our theory here is that all products in this portfolio of SUVs potentially steal from each other. Um, that's why you see all these arcs drawn between the vehicles. So that's what we speculate, or that's what our domain knowledge tells us that these dynamics occur when people shop for cars. So um, now you may ask, well, how can we quantify that? Well, in this particular case, we took data, sales data from the entire country across, um, you, know, you know, several years on a daily basis to estimate the, the relationships, to estimate a network, which looks like this. So this is the network that we have um, built between expert knowledge which says everything is related to everything else and the sales data. So our um, interest now is to understand, well, how do these three products interact with each other or kind of steal from each other, if you will. Very important business question. Um, it's remarkably little understood even today in the auto industry and presumably in many other industries as well. So let me perhaps start off what you might do intuitively, um, and which is also very easy, is simply to compute the correlations between these variables. That's kind of the default methods that most people would could even do with Excel. But that's not really what we're interested in. What we want to know precisely is, let's say we are starting with model A, make vehicle A, our target node, and what we want to know now is what is the causal effect of vehicle B, C, and D, each individually on the target node A. That's what we want to know because that's, um, yeah, that's important for our business purposes. Now for that, we will do a direct effects analysis as opposed to the total effects analysis that we did earlier in the predictive modeling context. So as before though, there are two ways we can do the direct effects analysis, and that is running a report or running a visual analysis. And we will see what, what both yield and when 
which ones or which of these is appropriate when. So now when we run the direct effects analysis, um, something a lot more happens in the background and I will just illustrate that. This is not necessarily something you would see as you run the direct effects analysis. So what, let's start here. We want to look for the direct effect of vehicle B or the sales of vehicle B on vehicle A. And in order to estimate it, to calculate that, we want that effect exclusively and we don't want to have any information flow via the other vehicles. The way we can get to that is we can we need to condition on these co-causes or confounders so we can isolate the effect of B onto A. When we use the direct effects analysis, that happens automatically. Uh, direct effects analysis invokes likelihood matching, which fixes the distributions of the confounders. It matches on the distribution and therefore allows us to calculate the effect. So that's what we get. Whenever we invoke direct effects analysis, which is available in many contexts, that's what happens in the background. It conditions through likelihood matching on all confounders. Now today we're not talking about how we assign confounders and non-confounders. Here I'm simply saying, all vehicles of interest in this domain are confounded. Um, as an alternative to, or actually let, let, let me now, now that I've told you what it does, let me show you the output of this direct effects analysis on target A. Here we can now see the direct effect. In this case, the direct effect is our causal unit effect we would see that one unit more of vehicle B sold would reduce the number of units sold of A by 0.46. So half a car less per day if uh, one more unit of B is sold. So uh, we can look at the direct effect, which is probably most easy to interpret here. Uh, there is also a contribution that is calculated in the contribution column, that's the share of the sum of the standardized direct effects. Just another way of looking at it. And finally, the elasticity, which is an important measure in marketing science, um, which would here in this case say if we increased the volume of B by 100%, the um, volume of A would be reduced by 72%. Now what's important to point out here that picture that we get now from this report is very, very different than the initial picture that we got through just looking at the Pearson correlation. So that's something very important to know. Uh, sometimes the Pearson, Pearson correlation may not even give us a hint of what truly happens in the causal sense. Now, um, Previously, as we ran the total effects analysis, we compared the report with the plot. Same thing here. Uh, for instance, if we look at how the direct effect is computed, it's once again looking at computing the curve and taking the derivative at the mean. That gives us the direct effect. And of course, the direct effect as a single value to interpret only makes sense if those curves look reasonably linear, which clearly is the case here, or mostly I would say. So let's look at a slightly different situation. Let's look at target node C. We want to know how A, B, and D affect C. We run the direct effects analysis again. Uh, we compute the plot. Um, once again, it's computed the same way. Uh, we take the derivative at the mean of the distribution of B and compute the slope. But what we will see here now, that is not as nice and straight as linear as the previous example. So here, 
the slope would be an appropriate characteristic for that narrow area around the mean of B, but certainly not uh, across the whole stretch of that curve. So, um, and, and therefore we really should never look at this in isolation. Never look at just a report with also having a good sense of the direct effects plot. So uh, a question we very often get is, you know, uh, this total direct effects differentiation, isn't that a little bit complicated? Couldn't I just stick to the total effects and look at that as a reasonable proxy for direct effects? And the answer is absolutely not. That would be a fatal mistake. We need to very, very clearly always differentiate where these belong. Total effects on the left side of the wall, direct effect on the right side. Total effects for prediction, direct effect for causation. If we were to make the mistake of misapplying this, uh, this would be the same thing what we did earlier with the umbrellas. Um, using this network now, the direct effects analysis, the correct one is on the left. If we ran a total effects analysis on the same model, we would get the plot on the right. And you see these curves are totally different, uh, whereas A truly has a negative association, a clearly negative slope in, in the causal sense, if we used the wrong, if we used the predictive approach by computing the total effect, um, the, 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 the curve of A would be flat. So if we were, if we reported the right one, while we need the left one, we would, making, would be making a major, major mistake and lead to totally wrong conclusions. Okay, let's do one more iteration. Now we're looking at D. Now D as is the target node. And again, we can run the report, we can run the plot. And additionally, we are calculating contributions. Now here, this is a little bit confusing because we have contribution on the left-hand side in the direct effects report, and we have contribution in the contributions report. And probably one day we need to do something about that nomenclature, but the, the right one, which the right contribution here that you see here, that refers to what, given the history, given that what we have observed over time, looking backward, how much did the actual sales of C, B, and A take away from D? So not forward looking in the sense of, well, if I were to sell one more unit of A, what impact would that have on D? Rather looking back over the history and saying, we've sold so many units of A over the last year, how much of my sales of D did that take away? Or conversely, in this case, um, what tells us the base level is the base level of vehicle D would be 109%. And given that we have this internal substitution, that brings it down to the 100%. So, so basically these three cars that we have in the portfolio uh, take away or take the 109% down to the 100% of actual sales of the. This is a very, very helpful uh, measure to understand when you look back, what have we actually achieved given, given the policies that we've applied, given the actions we've taken, given the, 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 the dynamics in our problem domain, what has happened, how have the values that have actually been observed, how have they impacted the target variable of interest. We have a, a webinar just on that topic 
and here's the link and I will actually fix the slide and the recording and then you will have the full link. So that brings us to the conclusion of the causal section. So we've now gone through a whole lot of concepts, at least 10 or a dozen different measures that all relate to importance. We started off with total effects. Then we talked about entropy, mutual information, arc force, node force, base factors, different visualizations, direct effects, contributions, elasticity. So um, if somebody asks you what part of it's important don't you understand, um, yeah, you can reasonably challenge that. Importance, there is a lot more to importance than our casual understanding that we use in everyday life. So this, this topic really warrants an in-depth conversation about what do you mean with that? What do you mean with important? What part of importance is important to you? So let me conclude real quick. Um, as you will probably know by now, we're doing a lot of seminars, a lot of webinars, courses, training events, and the two events, two principal events that are now coming up is an introductory and advanced course in Paris, France that will happen in about three weeks in, in Paris, France. Great excuse to travel to, to Paris in the fall. Very nice time of the year. Please note that even the courses in France will be conducted in English. Then in the context of our annual conference, we are offering an introductory and advanced course in Durham, North Carolina that will be in October. And yeah, please allow me to extend my invitation to you to this event. We expect this to be great again. This will be the seventh time that we're hosting the conference. Last year, was in, it was in Chicago, the year before in Paris. It's always a great event, lots of fun, meet lots of interesting people from different backgrounds, great conversations, great presentations, a fantastic way to learn about all kinds of use cases of Bayesian networks. And I hope this is a, a good incentive to come to the conference as well. We will be introducing, we will be formally launching Bayesia Lab 9. So that should be very interesting. Tons of great new features. Everything you've seen today, you can try out yourself with trial versions of Bayesia Lab. I recommend that you apply for the unrestricted 30-day evaluation version. That gives you the full feature set and allows you to do everything that you've seen today. We also have an online community for discussions about all kinds of things related to Bayesia Lab. So I expect lots of questions about today's webinar will be posted there and we'll be answering it there as well. So that brings us to the end of today's webinar. On behalf of our team, I'd like to thank you for your time and interest. Please do feel free to reach out to us with any questions that you may have. Uh, here are my contact details. Please also feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and we would always be happy to speak with you one-on-one -on -one about potential applications that you may have for our Bayesia Lab technology in your research. So thanks again. Um, I hope to see you at our next webinar and of course at our next, at our upcoming conference in October. Have a great day.